If you want to create your own prefabs and POIs for seven days, stick around to learn some useful tips and tricks for using the in-game prefab editor. If you want to stay updated with all things seven days and survival gaming, hit the subscribe button. So the first thing you're going to want to do is actually load up the prefab editing tool, which can be found via the main menu under the editing tools section. So you want to click that and then you want to click level prefab editor, and this will load up the editing tool and get you started on creating your very own point of interest. So from here, I'm going to bring up an existing POI just to show you off some of the most important tools that you'll need as you're creating your very own POI. And I'll do that by bringing up the uh, debug menu by pressing the escape key. And then I'm going to head over to here, the prefab browser. And then I'm going to bring up something like maybe just a gas station for now. So I just type in gas and then it will show me every gas station that has been added into the game so far. So I'll go with Jerry's fill. We'll go into there, we'll click load, and that will bring up the point of interest. So here he is, Jerry's fill. So we'll start off by showing you how to use the selection tool. So the selection tool is used quite a lot when you're building POIs. It's used for creating walls and floors and copying and pasting and a lot of other functions so we'll bring that up by pressing the z key so the z key will bring up a selection area and this area can actually be edited by holding the shift key and the g key and this will bring up a radial menu and this menu can increase the parameters of the selection area uh, so if you just pull on one of the arrows so that's the right arrow and that brings it out to the right the left arrow to the left and then you can bring it forward or backwards and up and also down uh, so from there you can also fill the selection area with any block from the creative menu so what you want to do is bring up the creative menu by pressing the alt tab button and then going over to creative and then you can choose any block there's a load of different categories there's props there's blocks there's shapes there's windows there's doors there's everything you can think of uh, so we'll go to concrete we'll click on concrete cube just for now uh, and that will be in our toolbar so you need to have selected the concrete cube in your toolbar because this is what determines the fill for the area inside the selection so to fill the selection you want to press the l key and that will instantly fill the area with your selected block so as you can see that's filled up there and then if you want to empty a selected area of anything and replace it with air blocks, you can also do that by pressing the J key. So that will completely clear the selection. Additionally, you can also rotate items within a selection with the X key. So we'll encompass this little cube structure here and then we'll press the X key and that will rotate it round. So from there, we can press the J key again and that will remove the selected item. Let's say you make a mistake while you're building your prefab. Uh, we'll just build a little structure there again. Uh, what you can do is you can press Control and Z buttons and these will undo the last editing action. So you can undo any little mistakes you make along the way. And finally, what you can do is you can actually move the selected area with just the G key. Uh, and this is done by uh, using these arrows once again and that can be done in any direction so that's pretty much it for the selection tool uh, what you'll also need is some of the dev tools which can be found in the creative menu again uh, what you'll probably need the most is uh, the brush tool so if you just search brush uh, make sure the dev blocks are on and then you'll find the dev paintbrush. The dev paintbrush can be used uh, in a number of ways. Uh, if you hold down the R key, uh, you'll bring up this menu here. And what you can do is you can copy a block, which will copy not only the block, but its configuration and its textures. Uh, so you can do that. You can also hold down R again, and then you can click the texture picker, which will instantly choose the texture of that block and apply it to your paintbrush. Uh, so you can just change textures really quickly and really easily. You can also change the um, type of brush you're using. So if you want to paint a large area really quickly, you can choose the paint fill button by holding down that R key again, and then pressing the right key and that will 
splat that paint on. Pressing the R key also brings up every texture currently available in the game. Uh, so you can choose from a number of textures. You've got wall ovens, you've got storage uh, containers, cabinet ranges, sinks, bookcases, and then you've got bricks and stuff like that. So you can just choose any of those textures and apply them as you wish. Uh, if you don't want to fill a massive amount of area, you can just click paint brush and this will just do one at a time. You'll also probably need the hammer, which is another dev block, uh, which you can find by just searching hammer again. And that one instantly breaks blocks uh, with one hit. Though I do find it is slightly strange that it does have a sort of a swing animation. So it does take ages. So if that is taking a while and you want something a bit quicker, you can search for the super digger, which is another dev tool which deletes blocks, but this one is much quicker. So that's just one tap and you can get rid of those much quicker. Um, you do need to be careful though, because it is an automatic uh, weapon. So you could hit things you don't mean to hit. So I find it's easier to just one tap with the left trigger and be a bit more surgical while using it. What we'll want to do is start on our very own prefab. So prefabs are normally defined by set sizes uh, ranging from very small to large. Um, and then there is an uncategorized size option as well, which usually refers to POIs found in the wilderness. And they can be anything over 100 um, block spaces, but very small will range from 25 to 25 blocks. Uh, small will range from 42 to 42 blocks, medium is 60 to 60 blocks, and then large is 100 to 100 blocks. Um, so for the purposes of the video, I'm going to start with just the 25 by 25 uh, space to uh, explain all the elements of a prefab and how to create it. Uh, so you want to press the escape key and then you'll want to go to the debug menu and prefab browser and then select the create new prefab option. Uh, so we'll discard the changes on that. And then here we are. This is our own prefab area. And this is where we can begin with our very own prefab. So what we want to do is create a selection area like I uh, taught you earlier with the Z key. Um, and we want to try and get a selection area of 25 by 25. We can test the selection area. It's hard to see right now. So we'll fill this for now, just so I can show off this selection area option. Uh, so up here, when you press the escape key, it will show you the area uh, you've selected. Uh, so I've got 18 by 21 there. So it does need to be brought out a little bit more. I think that's it, 25 and 25. So we want to click the L key again, and that will fill the selection. So now we have our base. So this will be our base selection here for our prefab, our foundation. So now we have our foundation. We'll want to build something uh, within it um, as our prefab. I'm going to do something just a bit rough um, just so I can show you the elements uh, that go into building a prefab. So we'll do um, that was with the shift and the G key. I've uh, stretch the area of the selection and then I'm going to fill it with the L key and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to click Control and C and that's going to copy that selection and then I'm going to move it out the way because it will mess up what we've got going already there uh, we'll just put that I think that was like two or three blocks uh, and then I'm going to click Control and V and that will fill that and then I'm going to use the hold down the G key again to move my selection and then I'm going to move that over there just for now because I need to rotate it. And if I rotate it in the area these two walls already exist, it's going to create holes and it's going to mess up what I've already done. So I'm going to click Control and V and that will bring up a new wall over there. And I can rotate it with the X key so it's in the correct orientation. And then I'm going to click Control and C again to copy that. So I obviously don't want a wall hovering over there out in the void. So I'm going to click the J key and that will clear my selection. And then with the G key, I'm going to move that wall back into place. You can also use the W, A, S and D keys to move this if you can't actually reach the arrow. So that's what I'm going to do for now. And that looks like it's in about the right position. There we go. And then control and V again uh, to copy and paste that there. So this is what we'll start off with just to show you sort of how to quickly start putting together a prefabs um, shell essentially. So we want to make sure 
if we're building roofs on prefabs, for example, uh, that the roof is stable and the structure isn't just going to completely collapse as soon as someone comes near it or walks on any of the floors or interacts with it in any way. So we're going to want to bring up the escape uh, menu, debug menu again, and then we're going to want to go to debug tools. And then from here, you'll be able to see a load of different options um, pertaining to uh, the simulation of this prefab in this environment. Uh, so we want to show stability and then it will all show as black and this is uh, having no stability at all. So this will instantly collapse if you were to have physics active. So we'll recalculate stability and this will show you um, through a color coded system how stable blocks actually are. So green is obviously very stable. This is not going to collapse just by interacting with it. And then that ranges through orange and then to red. There is also dark red and black and dark red and black are the most likely to collapse so we want to avoid dark red and black but for the most part red's fine uh, orange and yellow are fine um, they won't really collapse unless uh, players are blowing pieces off the building and then uh, domino effects will obviously ensue um, so the stability seems relatively fine here um, so if you want to remove that you just press escape and go to the debug menu again and then you can turn off show stability uh, but you will want to keep track of your stability as you go through building your POI um, I will actually we'll save this for now but I'll show you a POI I've been working on um, which has been a struggle with the stability so if we turn on stability here just to show off how difficult stability can be when you're creating sort of custom POIs uh, we'll recalculate stability there um, but yeah this is a difficult POI to build because obviously there is a central point that connects to the ground which is where stability comes from from the ground um, and any block that is I think more than four blocks away from a connection to the ground level is where the stability starts to weaken so if we were to build anything further than where I have now, it would become very unstable. Um, so we'll recalculate the stability by bringing up the debug menu with escape again, uh, and then we will recalc stability. And as you can see there, those blocks I've just placed are black. So if we were to um, put physics active on, which we can do by, uh, we'll turn off the show stability just so we can see what's going on. And then we'll turn on physics active. And then what we'll do is we'll press the Q key, which will stop me flying. And then I'll interact with these blocks below and they instantly collapse. There we go. So that's what could happen to your POI if you're in the dark red or if you're in the black stability range. So from here we want to work on some probably sleeper volumes which are the spawns for zombies inside your point of interest. So what you want to do is go back to the creative menu and search sleeper. And these will bring up sleeper entities. So there's a different options for what sleepers you want to place down. Obviously lying, standing, sitting, uh, there's animals, there's the new infested sleepers, crawlers only, uh, animals, stuff like that. So we'll just grab some sleepers, one, we'll have a, a lying down one, a uh, sitting one there. Uh, and then we want to place them down inside our POI. This is showing up as red right now, I believe, because there is no foundation or terrain helper underneath this floor. So technically this floor is unstable at the minute. So there we are, we have some sleepers set down. You can also change the configurations of the sleepers by holding the E key and it will bring up a sleeper block property menu. Um, so you can change their sight angle, their sight range, their hearing percent and their spawn priorities in here. I normally just choose monster closet or leave as default. I don't really mess around too much with those because uh, I want it to be as close to the base game as possible. So we'll leave those as that for now. Then what we want to do is bring up the escape key 
um, and go to, I believe it's volume tools. And then we want to select sleeper volume. So sleeper volume will essentially create a space in which the player will trigger these sleepers to spawn and to be active. You can also use other volumes that will spawn them before you enter these volume areas. But for now, we'll just focus on the base sleeper volume. So to configure your sleeper volume, you want to select it with the left key and that will just bring up uh, a green highlight around the sleeper volume that you're selecting. And then you want to press the K key and the K key will bring up a sleeper volume menu here. So because I've placed down three sleepers in my volume, I want to go to preset count and then I want to change that to two to three. So that means the sleep count will always be three and the amount of zombies being spawned will never exceed the sleepers that I've placed inside my volume. So that's fine. Um, and then you can also change your sleeper volume uh, triggers up here. So active, passive, attack, or trigger. We'll go on to triggers in just a minute because they are quite fun and I do enjoy them, but we'll stick with the base sleeper volume right now. Uh, so you can choose what actually spawns inside your volume via this menu just down here. Uh, and you can choose anything uh, from ferals, regulars, uh, even just styles like nightclub. Uh, so we'll click nightclub for now we'll have to test out our sleeper volume. So how to test that is to press the escape key and then come over to uh, debug tools and click play test. So we'll save that for now. So here we are in an instanced area for play testing our POIs. Uh, we've got a trader. So when we get over to making quests, he'll have the quests here and we can test the quests from inside the editor. You also get this prefab loot uh, container uh, where you'll just get some equipment and stuff like that just to test it out. You'll also get the dev tools, which I talked about earlier too. Uh, so let's go over and see how our sleeper volume works. You can also get around a lot quicker by pressing the Q key, which will bring on God mode. And then if you press the shift in Q, you'll jump forward. Here we are. And there they are, they've popped in. Um, so that's working fine. It's chosen to spawn two of the three sleepers this time. There we go, and that's all fine. So you want to press escape then, and then you can go back to the editor. So here we are back in the editor, and that's just the basics of sleepers. Um, you'll want to hide those as much as you can so you don't have the pop in like I just had just there. And if you wanted to remove a sleeper volume, you simply just select it and press backspace. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll press the escape key again, go back to volume tools, and we'll click sleeper volume again. So this time what we can do, also you can press the uh, shift and G and you can also edit the sleeper volume like you can with the selection volume. So we'll just do that there. And then what you can also do now is you can add an object. So it can be many different objects. It could be buttons, it can be containers, it can be doors, but you can trigger those zombies to spawn by using an in-game object. So for now, we'll just do a switch. So I'll search switch, grab a switch from there, place the switch down. And then if we hold the E key, we can open the properties of the switch. So you can obviously activate it, but you can edit the trigger. So this can trigger, let's say number one, and then we'll change the volume here to trigger. And this is triggered by, and then we'll click number one again. So that means this trigger of number one will trigger this spawn of number one now. So if we were to play test this again quickly, we will now see that if I click the E key and activate this switch, it will trigger those zombies to spawn. There we go. So obviously you wouldn't have that happen directly in front of the player. You'd either have a door or something that obstructs the sleepers from the player's vision uh, so it's not as jarring when they spawn in uh, but you can do that for a number of things you could have 
switch trigger a klaxon uh, light, a red flashing light, and then the zombies could spawn in from around a corner. You could do a load of different things with it. Opening a door, they could spawn on the other side of it. Opening a loot container, they could spawn around uh, the player in some nearby area. There's a load of different things you can do to make it a lot more dynamic. Uh, than just having the preset spawns and it makes the POI a lot more engaging. So now we have some zombies spawning in our location, we can add some quests. So the quests from the base game can also be added into your custom POIs and I'll show you how you can do that by going back to the creative menu and getting some of the quest elements. So the most important part of making quests is the uh, quest rally point which can be found by just searching quest and then it will be this exclamation mark right here. So put that into your toolbar, uh, normally they'll be at the front of a POI so we'll just pop that there um, and then we'll go back to the creative menu and then we'll get some of the quest elements. So as we can see here there are the fetch quest uh, loot containers, uh, there are the restore power generators, um, there's also the infested uh, reward crates uh, but for now we'll start off with the fetch quest items here. So there are two different types for the fetch quest. There's a uh, quest loot container here, which uh, if you place multiple, if this one is not actually active for the quest, it will just show as uh, foul trash. So there's also another option, which is a no placeholder option. Uh, so if that's not present, there will just be nothing in its place. It won't appear at all. Uh, so we'll just place that, place that. You can put multiple of these just to keep it a bit fresh if you're doing fetch quests. Uh, so only one of these will spawn when the quest is active. Uh, there won't be three of them, there'll just be the one. And this will rotate as you select the quest multiple times. Uh, so it keeps it fresh. And then we'll add the uh, restore power generator. And then we'll also add, uh, we'll go back to sleepers and then we'll get these red sleepers. These are for the infested clear quests uh, so we'll drop them down just pop them here I suppose uh, and then we want to create another volume for those and then from there we have all the elements for the quests uh, that we'll need so we've got the generator for restore power we've got the quest loot for fetch quests and we've got the infested clear uh, volume there. You can also, uh, like I said, add that infested clear, uh, infested clear crate as well as a reward. I'm not sure if it does matter too much. I'm not sure if it doesn't work without it, but we'll find out. Um, so there we go. From there, you want to open up the prefab properties list because this will add vital tags to making the quests work. So press the escape key and then go over to level tools and then come down to prefab properties. So through here, you'll see a few tag groups. So in quest tags, you want to click clear, you want to click fetch, you want to click infested and you want to click restore power. Uh, you can also change the district that these would work in for random world generation as well. Um, so you can put a tag for what the properties of the POI are. Uh, you can also put the zone, so if I wanted this just to spawn in downtown, I can click downtown and that will add all that information to the XML file, which is a vital file for the properties of the prefab, which we'll dive into in just a second. Uh, so we'll save that for now and we'll head over to the XML file now. So here we are in the XML file, uh, which can be accessed by clicking prefab properties and then the open XML at the bottom of that menu. Uh, so in here, what we want to do is actually add a line of code to make our quests work. So you can see some of the information here. 
uh, pertaining to the values of the prefab. So trader false, uh, difficulty value zero. So you can also edit the value in prefab properties or you can edit it here through the XML. But first of all, we'll want to add a line of code uh, to make sure that our quests work. So I'll just copy and paste that into here. And that code will be property name, quest tags, value equals clear, fetch, restore power. So now that's been added, we can close that, click save. Uh, and then we want to play test it to make sure that those are working as intended. So we'll go back to debug tools, play test, save our changes and see if those quests are now active and working. So here we are back in the playtest and we'll talk to the trader and see if our quests are showing up. So do you have any jobs? And here they are. So infested has been recognized, power restore has been recognized and fetch has been recognized. So we'll just test out one of those very quickly, accept our quest. There we go, find the White River supplies and there it is. So there is our fetch quest completed. Just press this just for fun. And uh, because this is a placeholder one, this is where the other fetch quest items would have been. Uh, but like I said, if you use the no placeholder, these will just be blank. There'll be nothing there. So now we're happy with our sleeper volumes, our build, our quests and our prefab properties. What we want to do is get ready to export this and possibly share it to others. So what we need to do now is actually create a prefab thumbnail, which will create a JPEG image, which can be viewed when loaded into someone else's editor and also into your own. Uh, so you want to press the escape key again, and then we'll want to go over to level tools and then we can show the bounds of the screenshot by pressing this here and it'll bring up this green uh, bounds area and that's all within the area so that's fine and then we'll want to click update prefab thumbnail and that will take a picture of the prefab and that will keep it in the POI browser uh, so we can see it. Then what we want to do is we want to update our imposter and that's a low resolution version of the POI which will be seen at great distances so update imposter and that's all good as well uh, we'll turn off the show bounds for a second uh, and then from there we want to get ready to export the POI so to do that you want to press the F1 key and bring up the debug console and from there you need to first of all type prefab and then simplify, hit enter, and then that will simplify your prefab. Uh, and then you want to follow that up by pressing the F1 key again, and then clicking prefab combine. And that will create a mesh of the prefab. So this is your prefab, it's combined, it looks a bit rough, but that's fine for now. Uh, this is how it will look all over the prefab, so don't be alarmed, that is supposed to happen. And then from there, what you can do is uh, you can either go into the debug console and then you can just type prefab export, or you can use the shift and G, make sure you're encompassing the whole prefab. Once you've selected the prefab, you can go back to escape and then you can click export prefab. Uh, but before we do that, let's just make sure in the prefab properties, we've chosen our difficulty. There we go, POI difficulty tier. So let's say uh, we want it to be difficulty three and then save that just before we export it. And then we can export the prefab here. There we go, so that's exported now. Uh, so we need to find our files by going to local disk, then going to your username and then clicking on your username, going to app data, roaming, seven days to die, and then go to local prefabs. And this is where you'll find a selection of files for your locally saved prefabs. Um, and what you want to do is uh, find the, the necessary files. And there's, I think, six of them. You've got your blocks.nim file, which saves all of the blocks used inside your POI. Then you've got your INS file, your JPEG file, which is essentially just your thumbnail for the editor. You've got your mesh, your TTS, and your XML files. So these files can all be shared by um, 
converting them to a compressed zip file. So what you want to do is you want to highlight all of those files. So the NIM, the INS, the JPEG, the MESH, the TTS and the XML. And then right clicking on all of those and then compressing to zip file. Once you've done this, this essentially creates a package that can then be shared with anyone uh, of your POI. Um, it's probably best to be sharing this via some sort of cloud service like OneDrive or Google Drive because if you try and send these files via email a lot of email services now flag these as threats because they're zip files and obviously uh, it could hide executables um, so uh, a OneDrive or a Google Drive is probably the best method of sharing this with someone else and these are supported on the seven days forums um, so that's probably the best place to share them as well as Nexus mods and other locations like that um, so once you found your files, compress them to a zip and then you've got a shareable package. So now you know all the basics on how to create your own prefabs, how to create volumes, how to use the selection tool in DevTools and how to export and share your prefabs with other people, uh, you can get started on creating your own. Um, if you've never done this before, this should cover pretty much everything that you'll need to get a prefab up and running and working at the basic level. Obviously there are more advanced tools and tricks that you'll need to know to do more advanced things. Um, I would recommend another channel called Physics Games. He's a great uh, YouTuber for prefab editing as well as not a gamer gaming. These guys are great at teaching uh, about some of the more nitty gritty stuff to do with the prefab editor. But I thought I'd just do a basic tutorial just to show you how to get started um, and start making some of the stuff that you want to make. Uh, I've started on a Vegas sort of themed uh, building pack set. So I thought while I was doing that and the information was fresh in my mind, I would share it with you guys. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more seven days to die gaming related content, then hit the subscribe button and why not check out one of my other videos on screen now.